Thank you everyone for uh, for joining the uh, the webinar today. Um, for those of you who do not know who Waterfront Alliance is, um, Waterfront Alliance is a US-based nonprofit organization with a growing alliance of more than 1,100 partners that focuses on environmental and economic development and bringing about real change to our shorelines, waterfronts, and coastlines across the nation, as well as in the New York and New Jersey region. Waterfront Alliance is launching a new monthly webinar series um, that is focused on building a space for critical conversations around key climate-related issues facing our region. We are so thrilled that you could join us today for our second webinar in the series, and we welcome you to visit our website to learn more about the upcoming webinars in the series. Today's webinar is entitled, Taking the Heat, Are We Ready? Our panelists today will discuss how resilient our current physical and social infrastructure is to, to, to extreme heat and what is needed to update these elements and to prepare historically disinvested communities for the heat. It is now my distinct honor to introduce you to our panelists today. Um, very, very excited to introduce Caleb Smith, um, who is the Resilience Coordinator for WE Act um, for Environmental Justice. They are a lead facilitator of the Extreme Heat Coalition that was launched as an extension of the Heat, Health and Equity Initiative. The coalition seeks to protect urban residents from, from heat stress through policy, adaptation and mitigation strategies by integrating nature-based solutions, green infrastructure, social resilience planning, as well as renewable and affordable energy programs. We're also very excited to introduce Karen Blondell, um, who is the Executive Director uh, for Public Housing Civic Association. Um, Karen is a native New Yorker from Coney Island. Um, she is also a veteran organizer and tenant association president of Red Hook Houses West. Um, in 2022, she was the Harvard Loeb Fellow and was recently appointed to the new Public Housing Preservation Trust a financing mechanism that uses bonds instead of private financing to repair NYCHA developments. Um, Karen is currently focused on building a new program, the Public Housing Civic Association, that will serve as a NYCHA watchdog and educate tenants on their rights about municipal government, public and fair housing and climate justice. I'm also very honored to introduce Paul Azito. Um, Paul Azito is the current Deputy Executive Director for the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Paul was formerly the Director of Housing Policy and Affordable Housing for the, for the New York Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, or GOSR. Um, prior to GOSR, Paul worked with various units of government and nonprofits, including the Urban Land Institute, and Local Initiative Support Corporation. And finally, very excited to, uh, to introduce Anna Burstein. Um, she is an Associate Professor of uh, po Population Health at New York NYU Grossman School of Medicine in New York City. Her lab uses simulation science to inform public health decision-making at the interface of infectious diseases and other health conditions. She collaborates with local public health agencies, health authorities in other countries, and international agencies such as the World Health Organization. Thank you all for joining the, uh, the conversation today, and we're really excited to jump right in. Um, would love to set the stage um, and really get an understanding of the heat for this discussion. Um, tell us about the heat. We're just coming out of a very long heat wave, and would love to really understand what's happening in the region today and what are some of the projections for the future. Paul, would you love to like to kick us off? Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for having me today. So just talking about the stage setting for what we're dealing with in New York City, let's start with the science of where we are, right? So we know that we were reclassified as a humid subtropical climate and we were classified a humid subtropical climate from a temperate climate. And so what does that actually mean for New York City is that we are hotter and wetter than we've ever been before. We know that in previous years, I think it was last year, most weekends it rained during the year. And that's in part because we are dealing with a different climate. That also means not only are we hotter and we are wetter, our 
our weather is more spontaneous. So this is where we were seeing cloud burst events, right? And we are also, which means that it rains specifically in one place for a longer period of time, but it also means that we're seeing unusual heat events where it's over 95 degrees for days at, on end. And what that means for the city is we all know what the urban heat island effect is, but what does it truly mean is that in the past, we were built for a city that was of a different climate. We have brick buildings, we have concrete sidewalks, we have black asphalt uh, for our streets. And what that means is that that absorbs heat. And in the past, that was more of a benefit for us. But now what we're seeing is that because we are made of brick, we are made of concrete and we absorb heat, the brick retains that heat and radiates that heat day and night back to us. And that compounds the issues that we are seeing in these extreme uh, heat events. Um, it, as unfortunately, leads to about 450 hospitalizations a year. And there's a quantifiable cost, of course, to the health care for those New Yorkers. And then there's an unquantifiable cost that we see where 350 New Yorkers die a year. As identified in our EJNYC report, they're largely disproportionately Black and Brown New Yorkers and people who have historically not had access to resources uh, equally. Um, those are the facts of the situation what we're dealing with, but I do like to talk about things from a potential point of climate optimism. Because we are having conversations like this, because of the folks who are on this panel, because of the other people who are really recognizing this as an issue, as an on hand, all hands on deck situation, we are taking a variety of actions that we can talk through from working to establish a maximum indoor temperature for New York City uh, buildings, working on an urban forest master plan to cool our temperature at the street level, looking at cool corridors and ways to repel heat from penetrating uh, concrete and asphalt surfaces, and a variety of other efforts that I'm sure we'll talk through in this, in this conversation and beyond as we evolve towards dealing and coping with the heat as it uh, impacts us into the future. That's very helpful. Thank you, Paul, for setting the stage. Um, Anna, would you like to share a little bit more about some of the projections that you're seeing? Sure. So I think one of the first things when we think about human health is, uh, you know, when Paul talked about the humid subtropical climate, in, in terms of health, the, the, the word humid is maybe the most concerning of those because our bodies, the way that we have evolved to cope with heat is by sweating and evaporating sweat. It's the main way that heat leaves us when we're too hot. And of course, sweat will not evaporate very effectively when it's quite humid. And that's why we start to see heat stress at much lower temperatures um, when humid heat compared to dry heat. Um, and so that, that's one thing that's concerning and, and exactly how the climate systems will, will kind of maneuver humidity um, in our region. I also just want to say, you know, as Paul said, there, there are real options for us in New York. There, there are things that, uh, that are doable that will be done that will make the situation better on the ground in New York. And there are global regions that, that don't have the options that we have. Um, in particular in parts of South Asia, in parts of uh, the, the Middle East and North Africa, where humidity can reach levels so high that an urban forest, you know, the heat doesn't evaporate from the trees. And it's, um, you know, some of these um, interventions are, are not as effective. And, and in fact, some of these places, um, when you actually look at what the weather stations are saying, it, it's getting to the brink of what people can tolerate. And so, um, you know, the other vital piece of this is we have to stop com combusting carbon, you know, we have to stop combusting fossil fuels, we have, we have to do the adaptation, but the mitigation is absolutely key. You know, we in New York, we will not be the first to tip into where the limits of adaptation are tested, that that'll happen in other parts of the world first, but we're a global community, we're a city of people from all over the world. And you know we we have to have a shared humanity, and I think that that means we have to equally value um, reducing the carbon footprint of our city. I, I very much appreciate that perspective, Anna. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the impacts, especially on on human health. Um, and and sort of to to follow up on that, would love to sort of go to you, Karen, and and really get a sense of. Um, who is impacted the most by extreme heat events in this region? And, and uh, what, do you, what are you thinking about sort of for the communities um, in terms of projections for the future? 
So thank you for having me as well um, today on this panel. Um, one of the things I want to point out is when Paul was talking, he was talking about the urban heat island effect on concrete. Uh, but it's also buildings like the building I live in. My building was designed in 1939 for World War II. It is as much concrete as you can get. Um, so these type of buildings, uh, once they heat up, the heat stays in this building for quite some time. Uh, thankfully, I'm in a, a six-story building that has um, some windows in the hallway, which allows for some type of airflow. Um, but the tower in the park design, which came after the 1930s, are the bigger buildings that are 14, 20, 22 stories tall. And they're not faring well with this type of weather. Number one, we need to rely on our skilled trades to do a little more. Um, I'm getting reports from residents that they're getting in elevators um, and the exhaust fan is not working. It's not working because of proper maintenance and repair. We have to have those systems working in these buildings, especially because they don't have any uh, airflow in the building. We can't create that flow. Um, as you know, there was a fire at uh, Park Towers because people left the door open and that draft situation in a tall building does give a, a it's, it's a safety hazard. But we have to start thinking about what are we going to do? I had a young lady who was stuck in an elevator the exhaust wasn't working. She had a uh, asthma attack. So we have to think forward. Thankfully, we do have a sustainability council at New York City Housing Authority, um, ran by some competent people. Um, I'm on that panel, I mean, excuse me, that committee. And what we're doing is we're trying to do uh, some adaptations, maybe, you know, having a sprinkler or some type of water device available near these towers, these buildings will help the person entering or leaving the building to cool down. Um, in the military, they take the people's arms and they put them in an ice uh, in an ice bath, just their arms up until they're like muscle, and that's a quick way to cool down. We have to find adaptations for our residents um, because it's going to be difficult to retrofit these buildings. I kind of feel like the work we're doing with resiliency around the city, trying to keep water out from surge and tidal flooding, then, you know, trying to reduce energy. It is, this is not a blank canvas. We have thousands of people living in place while these adaptations are going on. And we're not considering the fact that it costs us trees. We've lost over a thousand trees, 457 right here on the Red Hook West campus. So we don't have that shade to cool things down. And it does make a difference if you're on a really hot block. If you get near some trees and some outdoor shade, that temperature drops about 10 degrees um, and it becomes a little bearable. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. That was uh, that was really helpful and, and sort of teed us up for, for the next question as well. Um, would love to actually hear a little bit more about uh, the current readiness to our physical infrastructure, um, especially with, you know, we've, we're seeing more and more examples of our infrastructure kind of getting stuck in the extreme heat. Um, would love to hear how, how we feel about, um, you know, are we ready? Is our infrastructure, is our physical infrastructure ready for this extreme heat? Uh, Paul, do you want to, do you want to take us through that? So as it relates to our physical infrastructure, what we are doing is we're having a level setting moment in trying to identify how he impacts specific and discrete neighborhoods and then learn from that and extrapolate citywide. Um, one of the extrapolations that we've seen is uh, the need to expand our, our tree canopy. We know that in forested areas of New York City, I know not everyone considers trees to be infrastructure, but they are in fact are in a way for us, right? Um, 
We know that in forested parts of New York City, the temperature can be up to 13 degrees cooler than places where that don't have a significant tree cover. So what we are doing is we're working with parks, we're working with NYCHA, we are working with all of our campuses, all of our city agency partners to identify opportunities to expand our tree canopy citywide. And so over the course of the next year, you'll see us work through what we're calling our forest master plan for New York City. And the goal there is to expand the tree canopy, which has the co-benefit of creating some of the infrastructure that we need to reduce our urban heat island effect, make things cooler, and then the co-benefits that we see of reducing flooding in some instances and just uh, giving people a higher quality experience as they move through their, their neighborhoods. Other explorations that we're seeing that are uh, being explored are cool corridors. So I, I think the simplest way of talking about one concept of a cool corridor is that in cities further south, um, I believe it's Charleston, they apply a reflective paint to the ground. And what that does is it reflects some of that sunlight back into the sky as opposed to being absorbed into the asphalt, which actually reduces the heat island effect in certain instances. So that's another opportunity that we're exploring in our infrastructure. And lastly, what we're exploring is sort of the full consortium of social infrastructure on a hot day, what do you have access to? Do you have access to a pool? Do you have access to a park or another place of refuge? Do you have access to, uh, you know, to Karen's point, uh, a sprinkler or some way to just get a little bit wet or a mister so that you can cool yourself off a little bit? Um, and th those conversations are happening neighborhood by neighborhood because we all live in unique and distinct situations. And so, you know, if you're in the Rockaways, the infrastructure might be uh, increased access to swimming opportunities, so perhaps additional lifeguards. But in East Harlem or in on the concourse where I live, it might be additional sprinklers and, and more and more tree planting. I'd love to also maybe dig deep deeper into sort of what uh you know really thinking about the NYCHA housing system and um as well as the communities that that live in New York City and and um Karen and, and Caleb would love to sort of hear more about whether or not um you know there is a, a sense of readiness for our communities, especially in the NYCHA housing system, to uh to the extreme heat. Um, yeah, I could chime in. I think uh, I'll let Karen talk more about uh, NYCHA specifically, but I do think there is quite the opportunity to adapt more of our uh, vulnerable populations to the extreme heat. Uh, particularly, I want to bring in uh, Paul and Anna mentioned uh, how heat mortality is sort of changing in our region. Um, and one thing that's noted in the heat mortality report and in the most recent installation of the New York City panel on climate change is that temperatures below our heat advisory threshold where uh, solutions like our, our cooling centers become available. Um, people are, are dying at home um, because of that high humidity and uh, heat conditions. So folks who don't have access to air conditioning or can't run them because of the cost um, don't have places to turn to. Um, and a lot of the time that, that can be low-income seniors, um, young children with asthma in particular are a population in New York City that are especially vulnerable because we have such high asthma rates in the South Bronx, as well as uh, in Northern Manhattan, um, and people on with certain mental health medications uh, also face uh, a heightened risk because that can compromise, compromise uh, people's thermal regulation. Um, so we, we're seeing these heightened temperatures from May to September. Um, and some 
this this long term exposure is really what's uh, so difficult for us to adapt to, um, and for people to recognize uh, the actual threat posed by extreme heat. So scaling up strategies that lower temperatures in public and private spaces, uh, like the urban forest plan uh, that we act um, along with many other organizations advocated for, um, and actually bringing our, our cooling centers um, to be adjusted to what community needs are by investing in them, um, and making sure that people have the information to, to sort of make a, a extreme heat action plan um, are some things that we want to work on a lot more. And I'll just chime in and say, uh, this is also about education. Um, I find that a lot of elderly people in my community and across the city uh, resist air conditioning, even though I'm so happy that since the pandemic, the air conditioning program has expanded here in New York City. Thankfully so, because um, I see quite a few people took uh, NYCHA and the city up on that offer to get an air conditioner. Um, but at the same time, there was a cost incurred, uh, even in public housing, even though the cost is somewhere between eight and $10 a month, if you're on a fixed income, that could be a burden over time. Um, so you have a lot of people who have the air conditioner and won't put it on. They don't put it on for several reasons. We also have a diversified city where we have a lot of people coming from the Middle East and everywhere, where even though it's warm, they wear uh, all of the garb. And so I'm finding more and more people wearing long sleeves and jackets and things like that in this heat. I think we have to explain to them and stop just having like the temperature as the main focus, but maybe like also highlight the humidity and how that affects the body so that people know that they need to find a way to dehumidify that unit so that they are okay inside of these units. Um, humidity also brings mold. We are on a campaign at New York City Housing Authority to get rid of mold. So this is another exasperation that happens because of climate change, that there will be more uh, mold spores um, in these uh, apartments. So again, I think education is like extremely important that we use our cooling centers, our senior centers, our community centers to educate people as to what the temperature is now. And what Paul said earlier that we used to be a temperate zone and now we're a subtropical. I think that needs to be blasted out for people to see that this change actually, actually happened within the last five years. Um, so they know what that feels like and what you know, what, what we have to do here. Um, and then finally, I just want to say something because I'm always cautious. Um, yes, I am an environmental advocate, but I advocate for consensus building and give and take here. Asking for the whole world to just get rid of fossil fuels is not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. It has polarized our city and our states and nationally. We need to take this one step at a time. I'll give you a great example. Uh, solar panels, we would love to have them on our roofs, but we declined. Number one, these are brand new roofs that we just got. We have to make sure that the people who are going to install them and maintain them are not compromising our roofs, further exasperating leaks from cloud bursts and just rain. Um, the other thing is we can not use our own energy in our building. So I'm a NYCHA resident. You want to put the solar panels on my um, roof, but I already get my uh, electricity from New York Power Authority at such a low rate. It I, we would never, and expect we would never convert over to the solar because number two, our wiring is still from the 1940s. So anytime you open up any of these outlets, walls, um, conduits in these apartments. It's completely collapsed. We have to start rebuilding the skeleton of the infrastructure before we start telling everybody to get rid of all the fossil fuel 
because it's too polarizing. It's not going to work. We have to take little but swift steps towards our goals. And that means all hands on deck. Uh, really quickly, I, I do want to uplift some things that we act as advocating for at uh, the federal and state level that can start to address some of the issues of like energy affordability that we brought into the conversation so far. Uh, particularly the low income home energy assistance plan is something that we see needs like a much larger allocation in New York State. Um, only about upwards of 20,000 households are able to benefit from the cooling assistance benefit. And in the past couple of years, we've only been able to allocate around three to 4% of the LIHEAP budget for cooling. So that leaves a lot of people behind. Uh, and when we do get more of that funding, it needs to be more flexible uh, so that it can be used to cover that, that cooling cost um, in the summer months, as opposed to only providing uh, air conditioning and other cooling devices. So that's a change that we, we're continually working on. Um, and Karen mentioned some housing is not prepared to install um, renewable energy directly onto the property. Uh, but things like the, the Build Public Renewables Act and its implementation, we need to make sure that uh, community solar is accessible to those households that can't uh, directly install um, you know, renewable energy solutions and ultimately help bring costs down for uh, for low-income households and build out the infrastructure for more private renewable uh, energy resources to be added to the grid because we do need that resiliency as our need for cooling uh, scales up. Appreciate this uh, the sort of framing about you know these these steps that are needed to take that are needed to be taken in order to build more resilience for extreme heat to our region while also reducing the uh, the the sort of the what's happening and and sort of the impacts that that is uh, that's being had. Um, I think what I'd love to hear a little bit more about is uh, is really just the uh, the significant challenges to our social systems. And Karen, you touched on this a little bit. Um, would love to hear about you know when we're sort of thinking about protecting vulnerable po populations from the dangers of extreme heat. You know what are what are our significant sort of challenges? And uh, and Anna, I know that you're sort of seeing this from a global perspective. Would love to hear more about what you've you've encountered? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we just heard from Caleb about the question of grid resilience and needing to have you know, different ways to generate electricity. When you when you zoom out to the rest of the United States, it, it gets really concerning. Um, I think the state of Texas is a particular concern because the electrical grid there is not connected to the national grid. We've already seen some you know, very devastating power outages in cold weather. And I think it, it's not even it, it's it's expected that there will be more power outages at times when the grid is stressed. So you know, what does that look like during a heat wave? You know that that's a very concerning thing. Um, and I you know, I think that the the air conditioning piece is important because daytime places of refuge you know they're important, um, but particularly in more humid climates, the humidity in the air it acts like a blanket essentially that traps heat in, which means in, in dry heat climates, it gets quite cool at night typically, but in humid heat climates, it does not cool off at night. And so the, the big problem that creates is sleep. You know, the human body, it has to drop its temperature to sleep properly. And so you know, people will, will go without sleep um, over prolonged heat waves when it doesn't cool off at night. And so we, we need to think about the, the air conditioning piece or some, you know, some place where people can be cool, particularly when they're asleep. It's just such a vulnerable time. Um, and then, you know, looking even beyond the United States, there are parts of the world where there simply isn't air conditioning, you know, where the grid is even more fragile and, and people don't have air conditioning in the infrastructure. 
know, I think about places like Mumbai city, which have these very, very dense informal sediment, se settlements or slums, you know, many times, many New York cities worth of people, um, you know, living in these very dense settlements where there is no air conditioning, there is no cooling shelter. It's not clear how to even build one because there isn't square footage. People are living in every square foot of space. And, you know, for, for those places, there, there aren't clear solutions, you know, even, even of the kinds that we're talking about. And it's really going to take some, you know, I think it's going to take mitigation. Of course, it, we have to stop emitting CO2, um, but that won't be enough at this point. It's also going to take innovation to protect those communities. Can I just add for Anna that, um, you know, when I was in Harvard and I was thinking about uh, India and COVID, and a lot of times people talk about the United States caused a lot of the climate change and all of this stuff. But I also pointed out to them that we also are one of the most generous countries in the world. Anytime there is a worldwide global pandemic, trauma, whatever, we are constantly sending money to other regions. But I was thinking about that and I said, like, why can't we build in, when I found out like that India has these communal bathrooms um, that everybody has to use, and COVID was around, I was like, well, why didn't we put it inside of our policy that if we give you a uh, hundred billion dollars, you have to spend a certain percentage to create more uh, uh, private bathrooms or settings that start really like opening up uh, so that uh, this uh, these communicable, communicable diseases don't spread so easy in those regions. We have to start trying to put it inside of our policies as well. And I, one policy change I would like to see because public housing also is a place for a lot of children. And what happens is, you know, we hear you got a two bedroom, you have a three bedroom. I also told the professors in Harvard, we should start going by square footage because a three to four bedroom could be under 900 square feet in public housing. So now you got three, four kids living in one room without an air conditioner. If we can start opening up the process to allow even just families that have children to get one so that our children can go to sleep at least semi-comfortably, this makes a lot of sense for them the next day when they get up to go to school, they will actually have a refreshing sleep. So I'm advocating across the board that we don't just like uh, think the old school way that you know, it's only about seniors. It's about everybody. And it's about how many people are within a square footage that have to share the and the same breathing space. Um, you know, we draw heat. And so we all have a right to remain cool. And that should be what we are saying that we have a right to remain cool for all of our families. So thank you. No, I think, Karen, both Addition. of those points were so critical. Um, do you want to go ahead, Paul? No, no, by all means. No, I just want to, well, I want to acknowledge the, the point that you made. And I think, you know, communities like NYCHA, like our immigrant communities in New York, they serve this un underappreciated function. I think that they are, they're the ones that absorb when people need a place to go. You know, people, when someone, you know, they who would have been on the street is living on your couch by and large that gets absorbed by public housing you know immigrants who come to our city whose couch are they on they're in our immigrant communities and their their bodies are radiating heat they're in that space they're using those facilities and so giving those families some relief and some headroom and some gratitude you know because it's a service to be helping those in need especially for people who themselves are, are struggling right um and, and just get, you know, giving, you know, providing the resources so that people can do that because it is an incredible service to our city, all the people who are doing their part with, with not enough. Um, I, I wanted to mention that your point about the bathrooms and kind of that global scope because it's um, actually something to keep an eye out for. There is a institute that is, will hopefully be built on Governor's Island, the New York Climate Exchange. And um, I have a close friend who's an innovator in redesigning um, bathrooms, redesigning air conditioning, kind of using engineering to help with this problem. 
Um, I'll tell you his name and you'll never forget it. Um, his name is Shannon Yi. He's a professor at Georgia Tech and I'm gonna say a naughty word here. So um, the, the modern toilet that we use, um, they say the word to crap, meaning to go poo, um, is at, comes from the name of a gentleman, Thomas Crapper, who is sort of credited for inventing, inventing the modern toilet and some dispute that this is true, but it, it's, it would be an odd coincidence if it's not true. So Shan, you'll never forget the name Shannon Yee because he hopes he'll be remembered um, because we'll say, I have to go ye instead of I have to go pee because he has reinvented the modern toilet. Now, why did he reinvent the modern toilet? Because in parts of the world where there's communal toilets, um, the problem is that people don't have plumbing to their homes. There's no plumbing hookup. So it's not enough to build yourself a bathroom. The city has to put a, you know, or someone has to put a plumbing line and that it's 2 billion people who don't have access to sewered sanitation. So uh, my clever engineer friend, uh, Shannon, has created a toilet that actually uses the chemical energy in the human waste itself to safely dispose of that waste and kind of burn it up and make it go away. Um, which is kind of cool. We'll see. Um, I hope he's planning to put some prototypes on Governor's Island if the whole thing is successful. So you could go visit the climate exchange and use his clever toilets. But I think it's just an example of, you know, you, you talked about, Karen, how America is generous financially. I think America is also generous with our minds and with innovation, you know, inventing medicines, technologies. And that is the place for us to be right now is using all of the innovation in our country to try to find solutions to these problems so we can adapt. I, I think I've learned so much in that last three or four minutes. I feel like I needed to take contemporaneous notes. I wanted to elevate some two points that Caleb and Karen had made. One is that we are approaching a point in time because our climate has changed where it, we formally had a, a right to heat in our city, right? Because it would get so cold that people could freeze to death. And it was seen that cooling was a comfort. And with our climate changing, we are discovering that cooling is more than a comfort. It's the same as freezing to death as heat stroke is a real an issue and concern. And we're trying, and we are all through these innovations that we've talked about trying to figure out how to establish a rapport as a city on how to make sure that we recognize the right to be cool, right? And so to your point, Karen, how do you do that in a home where people culturally wear different, uh, different types of clothing? How do you do it in a, in a home where perhaps there's a larger number of people per square foot than what we would consider to be like on average. And then how do we get those people cooling devices? And as I think you rightfully pointed out, it's complicated in instances where we are trying to do renovation and restoration work in NYCHA and in buildings citywide where we did not originally build in this concept of a right to be cool, right? And so we are through heat pumps, through different systems and different interventions, trying to figure that out in real time through conversations like this and through that full court press that you were talking about and trying to figure out importantly, how to coordinate those uh, updates to the buildings so that we, there are other co-benefits and opportunities, perhaps if you're going into someone's apartment, whether it be NYCHA or HPD regulated or otherwise, the expectation is, is that you put in the cooling elements. And then in addition to that, you do other necessary upgrades. Um, and creating that rapport and that pipeline for people is, is still an ongoing conversation for us all to figure out. And then the last point that you brought up earlier, which is very, very important, is that this administration has advocated and, and we act and others have advocated for additional expansions to LIHEAP and HEAP and other programs to make sure that not only do people have access to air conditioning units, ideally heat pump units because heat pump units are lower emission, but also the means to pay for those units when they're they're installed because the goal here is that no one is disproportionately burdened or heaven forbid does not turn on a cooling system because they feel like they, they can't afford it. Unfortunately, at this time, when we continue the advocacy, um, we are, those programs are less funded, particularly in what was historically seen as cooler climates 
because the formulas are still akin to Arizona disproportionately gets resources to cool people because of the uh, perception of that climate. But now with our changing climate, we are advocating to make sure people recognize that we have a large number of people, we have a unique set of circumstances that really behooves us to target more resources uh, towards cooling. That's very helpful, Paul. Thank you for thank you for raising those points and actually teeing us up for the next question. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, Caleb, about um, what we act is is sort of doing in terms of advocacy for extreme heat. Um, would love to just hear more about some of the policies that are embedded in the extreme heat agenda, um, and if you could also share a little bit more about the extreme heat coalition that's also advocating for for this agenda. Yeah, thank you. So you did a great introduction of the coalition so far, um, but basically we're working to build power uh, starting in New York City metropolitan area and building out statewide, um, advocating for uh, the most heat vulnerable populations, especially those um, living under urban heat island effect um, for these state level uh, policies. And I mean, we spent some time talking about what we're working on at the city level to sort of set a precedent for New York State, uh, particularly the indoor maximum temperature bill. Um, and that was introduced only last week. Um, so I can put that in the chat. And while there is like definitely a lot to consider, uh, our coalition consulted on the bill taking into account uh, things like uh, a nighttime reset and, and quality sleep uh, that is so uh, important, uh, which is interrupted by the, that, you know, these high temperatures at night. Um, so that's, that's a consideration that was taken um, in setting the, the threshold for outdoor ambient temperature and the cooling capacity of, of the device required. Um, also, we talked a little bit about humidity and asthma. Um, particularly air conditioning and heat pumps are so important because they help dehumidify as they cool, which makes uh, the air facilitate less irritants uh, to asthma and, and makes it uh, easier for people that have symptoms to you know, have uh, air that does not uh, further aggravate their symptoms. Um, another bill that we're working on is codifying cooling centers. Uh, our members have led reports um, kind of taking stock of uh, what's available at cooling centers, the services that they're able to receive, um, and Codifying cooling centers would allow for the Office of Emergency Management and the Department of Health uh, to really designate the number of cooling centers and standardize uh, the resources available and including it in the city charter uh, then opens up the program to receive uh, a line item in the budget and the, the budgeting process. Uh, which is really important when we're talking about uh, allocating resources to a comprehensive outreach strategy, uh, feedback, feedback mechanisms for residents to really talk about their experience and how to improve uh, the, the quality of cooling centers as we continue to have them as uh, a first line of defend for people that don't have air conditioning at home. Uh, so those are some of the things we're working on at the city level, at the state, um, the New York Heat Act, which would have capped uh, energy burden for households at 6% did not pass this year, but it's definitely something that we will integrate in our, our state advocacy moving forward, um, because that is something that is so critical to our future that we don't have anyone who's 
can't afford to pay their electricity bills. Um, and that also touches on the mitigation piece of uh, not subsidizing the extension of our gas infrastructure when we know that it will be a stranded asset at some point. It's really uh, a fiscally responsive, responsible and uh, climate informed way to think uh, about our, our future of energy in New York State. And then lastly, I'll briefly touch on um, a, a new addition to our uh, our state policy goals in the extreme heat policy agenda, and that's uh, including cooling in the warranty of habitability. Um, the warranty of habitability is basically uh, state standards for safe housing. Um, and we mentioned, you know, heating is required in that, electricity is required in that, um, you know, making sure that there's no leaks, all of, the, all of these really basic standards. Cooling is a part of that. If we can recognize that uh, temperature control uh, is vital to human life, we need to have cooling. Um, and so the reason why we need this in addition to an indoor maximum temperature, not only does every city need to plan for this, but also it helps reduce the cost burden being shifted on to tenants because we mentioned there's a lot of building upgrades and electrical retrofits that need to happen. Um, this would require that um, uh, major capital improvements aren't passed on to the tenant when they're adding cooling. This is a cost that um, really needs to be shouldered by uh, those that have a variety of different ways of accessing capital and that is not and that's not our low income households that are already burdened uh from cost of living um whether that's energy affordability or um all these other you know systems that make it really hard for them so try to sum up a lot there i know we have questions in the chat um but yeah, I, I hope that helps kind of clarify a broad range of the things that we're advocating for. That's that's really helpful, Caleb. Really appreciate you going uh, through. Well, honey, through lists. While we're yeah. waiting for while we're waiting for our state, city, and federal government to come to our aid, uh, I am proposing that we find a way to uh, distribute shades. Uh, when I first moved into NYCHA in 1982. They gave us the first set of shades for all of their custom sized windows. Um, and so after that, subsequently, I had to buy my own shades. I am proposing that we bring that, those shades back or even going a step further. Uh, uh, I've been talking to my borough president here in Brooklyn about facilitating uh, blackout curtains for two reasons. Number one, it'll cool things down immediately um, for the warm months, and then it kind of insulates uh, in the winter months. But we're going to have to do some real basic stuff too. Like I get that we need policy changes and we need to change the way we design things, like what's going to be happening on Governor's Island. But <laughs> right now, the immediate thing is to get the cooling to them right now. So I am proposing that we look into the smaller, uh, uh, the small ones. And I'm gonna have to turn this off because I ran out the other room because they're jackhammering and the whole building's shaking. So pardon me. I'm sorry, Karen, that you're experiencing that. That's that's not great. Um, but I really do appreciate both of what uh, Caleb and Karen that you're you're sharing here. I think it is really important that uh, that we're thinking about it from a systems perspective, but also thinking about what can be done right now. Um, and I think I think that's that's really in incredibly important and goes to my last question um, about how can we bring organizations and stakeholders and actors like academia, like, you know the mayor's office, like organizations like We Act, and and Karen representing the community. 
how can we bring us all together to really collaborate on building a more sort of resilient future um, to uh, to to the region for uh, against against extreme heat? Would love to hear recommendations, examples, um, you know, things that have worked in the past. Anyone can start. <laughs> Um, I would just, oh, I, I heard someone else. <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, I would just kind of lean on uh, building out processes that uplift community-led strategies, um, particularly the success of Be A Buddy and We Act has also developed a climate-ready uptown plan, uh, which basically helped identify uh, assets to help respond to emergency situations, provides education about uh, extreme heat and flooding, um, and help people uh, sort of map out a plan when it comes to uh, transit infrastructure that might be impacted, um, as well as points of information in their communities, um, and ways to strategize with their neighbors. So that's a module that we uh, train other community-based organizations uh, to bring to their member base uh, and customize for a neighborhood-led strategy around uh, climate emergencies. So as much as the city can support and seek federal or state funding, um, looking at like the Bond Act and the IRA to support things that do that. Um, both looking at like resilience planning, like I'm talking about, but also uh, infrastructure as well. I think that process of constantly consulting, like what works for, for this specific community, I think uh, will really light the way forward. I just wanna elevate exactly what Caleb said. We have a program called Climate Strong Communities. And the benefit of that program has been to go to high heat vulnerability, high flood vulnerability neighborhoods and meet people where they are, say, this is the vulnerability that we're seeing. How would you address it? And here are the current tools we know that are available to you. And what that's enabled us to do is have real conversations with people about their specific needs. So we'll go to a community and we'll say, you have this number of libraries that can serve as cooling centers. You have this number of pool opportunities in this high heat vulnerability area. You have these additional resources. Or did you know that if you're feeling sick or fatigued in the middle of a heat event, you know, you should get water immediately or you should seek shade or you should seek rest, right? So there's that social resiliency component emerges from having conversations directly with people about the issue at hand. And it also helps us identify ways in which we can support that particular community's needs. And so those are the infrastructure needs that we talked about. Do you need an additional pool? Are you advocating for additional pool hours? Are you advocating for more street trees? And that, to, again, to Caleb's point, there are other co-benefits that we often discover through that process, right? So often you have high heat vulnerability and flood vulnerability and a simple solution on a particular street corner could just be a tree. I just wanna jump in on, on the tone of simple solutions with co-benefits. What about kicking cars out of New York City? <laughs> Combusting huge amounts of gasoline makes things hot. It, you know, it detriments air quality noise. It makes it not safe for kids to be out moving around independently. Um, clearly, there's a climate mitigation problem. There, you know, automobiles are the number one source of carbon emissions from our city, but there's also a huge adaptation piece, I think, that maybe is underappreciated. It, it's one of many reasons that we need to manage having the avenues being essentially freeways through Manhattan. So, so our office works on advocating for transportation solutions, mass transportation solutions, and reducing the number of vehicle trips so that we can use that extra space for a communal need or for the community that lives in that community as opposed for, to, for uses 
for people who are driving through a community. So, and that's a point of alignment. The structural change that you're talking about, which would be say removing cars from New York City, that has to be a collective dialogue that would happen over the course of a period of time. But that does speak to a broader issue that comes up time to time when we have these kinds of conversations. And so the biggest piece of infrastructure that we all have are the human beings, the human capital that we have. And if we all collectively choose to make a different decision, then that structurally changes how we live. The example I always like to use is the hole in the ozone layer. When I was a kid, it was all about the hole in the ozone layer. It was a big problem, right? How do we deal with the hole in the ozone layer? Or did we solve, why do we not hear about it? It's because we solved the problem, right? And we solved the problem because we as humans use our collective will to stop using chlorofluorocarbons and all of the pollutants that degraded the ozone layer and it's on track to be repaired. And so to that end, using, trying to find ways, whether it be removing cars, whether it be other shifts that we as a, a collective take to address the, t the climate issue is not only necessary, but can produce a number of different innovations that can help us deal with extreme heat and extreme weather events in general. Um, let me chime in because I ran outside and told these guys to cut that noise for five minutes. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think like all of these solutions are great and it makes me feel hopeful. Um, but at the same time, you know, we have to like, when we put in trees, we can't just put in trees. Trees take a long time to grow. They grow about 10 inches a year. So to get the size of the trees that we really had, is gonna take quite some time. But what we need to do is put in some tree stewardship. We need to connect our youth to our seniors and get them to adopt a tree together. Now we have the youth who starts bonding with the resident or the senior and they can kind of like monitor if the senior needs some water. Um, those conversations can come out. Old school, seniors no way to cool down that we don't. There were some old uh, recipes and um, generic ways that we healed ourselves uh, in the South and across America, some of those things still work, you know what I'm saying? But we, we definitely need a tree stewardship program that pairs us intergenerationally, especially since you were talking about all these lovely trees going in. When they go in, they have to be incubated. You just can't put it there and it's just going to miraculously do well. Somebody has to water it. Someone has to clean the, uh, the area around it. There's a lot to do, but it can be done and we can do it in a way that's strategic using some of the stuff that the mayor already had, like those conversations that he had across communities to kind of like cohese people together to start having these conversations. So I wanted to say that. And again, I'm very hopeful now that I spoke to all of you. Oh, and one more thing. NYCHA does use some new uh, innovation. It's these heat pumps that not only heat the apartment, but it cools the apartment down. Um, and um, that's being piloted in a couple of developments. Um, I did see it. Uh, it looks good for some developments, but we have to remember we're spending money now. And if we spend money now, and then we ask two years from now, can you upgrade the system? A lot of times people feel like you didn't get your value for the system in place. So like in Red Hook, we're still on the old system of steam when we just spent a half a billion dollars for sandy resiliency, but we're using the old method. So I don't see them coming to Red Hook anytime soon with these heat pumps because they're going to say, we already spent X amount of dollars in Red Hook on delivering uh, domestic hot water and, and, and um, you know, heat. So we got to think about, be a little more strategic. Karen, thank you. Thank you for uh, for sharing that. And I know that we're at time, um, but uh, but just wanted to ask one quick question from the audience, if, if you will just sort of stick with us for another minute. Um, one, the, the question I think is, is a very easy one. Um, does 311 reporting in terms of heating and cooling and human health and housing account for the smaller square footage allowed for public housing or does NYCHA need to update its policies to account for these sizes and the number of people in these units? 
um, Paul, Karen, I'm not sure if, uh, if any of you have the answers. I know 311 um, just recently started actually letting public housing make any type of calls to them. We were told for years, you know, you have to speak to New York City Housing Authority. So I would say that no, they don't know that much to account for square footage or the way a building was built, you know. Um, but uh, it's a work in progress, you know. I do have still that confidence that um, if we all work together with we act with the uh, the uh, mayor's office of climate and environmental justice, with our epidemiologists across the city, with I think that we can come up with some solutions. It's not going to be one size fit all, but we need to keep on talking to people on the ground because they're going to keep telling you, yeah, you put that air conditioner on, but I hate air conditioning. Why do you hate air conditioning? because it costs me 10 bucks a month to run it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We have to go into those conversations. That's a very good point. I, I can see just on the point of like the sizing and scaling of the, the cooling unit uh, to the extent that it's feasible and it's provided by the city, we make sure that it has the appropriate number of BTUs for the space. But to, you know, to Karen's point, every situation is unique. You know, you size an air conditioner appropriately, but then you might find an instance where there's an insulation issue or a window is opened or cracked or needs replacement and it's on a list and thus you have a loss or a leakage that's not anticipated in the calculation. And that's part of the reason why this is an ongoing conversation about how to make sure to take pre-existing buildings meant to heat people and uh, adjust them for, for pooling. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Um, really, really appreciated this conversation so much. Uh, appreciated our, all of our audience for staying with us for an extra three minutes. Um, and uh, and we hope to continue this conversation. It's really important. Um, this is just the beginning. And, uh, and we hope that we can continue to collaborate across um, all different sectors so that we can make this region a little bit more resilient. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining and a special thank you for the panelists as well. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you all. Take care. It was a pleasure. So Please stay in contact. Thank you. Privilege.